Well, good morning. Um, this is a very impressive turnout for a man that was obviously deeply loved by uh, not only his capital and industry colleagues, but an extended and very large family. Um, so we appreciate everyone taking the time to come. Uh, as you can see, what we thought would be uh, helpful for folks is to have a few of the capital colleagues that knew and worked with John give their anecdotes about him. I mean, Stephen Peoples has done a fabulous job in terms of researching and writing a lot of background on John, but I think there's a perspective that those that worked with him uh, through the years can give you that, that hopefully will add to your knowledge of how, uh, how much he was revered and respected by those of us that worked with him. Um, first of all, I wanted to just say that uh, I, my experience with John was very different than a lot of the people you'll be hearing from because I was actually tasked to be his administrative assistant uh, for a period of time, and those of you that know John probably realize that he didn't do a lot of managing. He uh, just let me do what I do best, which is run around and take care of business. Um, but in a business where I was told early on and found out that you're only as good as your last hit record, it truly is astounding that someone like John Palladino was uh, a success and remained a success and very respected colleague in the music industry for decades. So that speaks volumes to who he was and what he did so well. Um, my, my tenure with John was very brief, but what I took away from that and what I remember 30 plus years afterwards is that wonderful, broad, warm smile. Every single day when I walked into the office, John would just give me that, because he was always there before me. I didn't show up till 9.30. You knew that, Rupert. Um, so he had a very broad smile and those warm eyes. And with John, it was a, a almost an amused perspective of watching all of what I called the fast talkers and speed walkers that would be going in and out of his office and around the tower. And John would just be observing all of this in that very calm, bemused fashion that he did, that he had. Um, and he also, for me, epitomized what I term a gentleman, because that's exactly what he was. He was a gentleman. He had incredible grace under pressure. I never saw him get truly upset. He had, uh, I never heard him say a bad word about anyone, although I would try and egg him on on multiple occasions. <laughs> he just wouldn't take the bait. And he loved what he did and was very humble and didn't expect any kind of accolades or praise or pats on the back. He just loved coming into the office every single day and he loved his work. And that to me is truly a gentle man that is, is enjoying every single day of his life. So before I uh, introduce you to other speakers, I did want to take a moment and hopefully you've recognized that there are certain people that have multiple stars. Uh, some people have complained that they don't have as many stars as others, which we can certainly rectify, but um, I would like to recognize the uh, small group of conspirators, as Stephen Peoples has, has named us, who made this event happen. Um, and I'm sure some of you know that it takes an enormous amount of uh, perseverance and coordination to bring everyone together. So, first of all, I don't think I saw her. Is Paula Salvatore here? Has she? Oh, okay. So, could we please just give a hand to Paula, who allowed us to use this wonderful studio A. So, thank you very much. I wanted to make sure you get your name tag so that we, oh good, so that we know who you are. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> um, Barbara Blanchard, so again, I can organize and, and um, some people would say boss, I say direct, the capital part of this, but Barbara really had a much more heroic effort in that she needed to reach out to a very extended family 
um, and across all kinds of different states to pull them together, to organize them, to coordinate that. So Barbara Blanchard has been phenomenal in coordinating all of this with the Palladino family. So thank you very much. For that. <laughs> Mr. Dan Davis. Mr. Dan Davis, for his ongoing support, good humor, and admirable peacekeeping uh, skills, there were several times when Dan had to talk me down from the roof when he would let me know about certain changes, but he did it all with graciousness and semi-good humor. Um, so you'll be hearing from Dan shortly. And of course, Stephen K. Peoples, I can't really say enough about uh, what Stephen has done for this occasion. He has spent many, many, many hours pulling together what hopefully you folks are enjoying, which is the slideshow, posters, the playlist, and he's also arranged for a photographer to be here so that the photographer will be able to record this event, and then um, he will tell you how you can access uh, the video and um, pictures from this event. So you can record them, you know, you can take your own photos, but just to let you know again, Stephen has really made a point to make sure that everything that's happening is memorialized. So uh, he has been phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this is my allergies. It's nothing to do with this final person I'm introducing. Um, so Rupert Perry, this event would not have happened. Uh, I'm what they call an implementer. Some people call it an executioner. I don't like that term at all. But I can implement, I can organize, but if I don't have someone that is really committed to making something like this happen, that has the ability to influence, negotiate, and um, ensure that when obstacles come up is fully committed to ensuring this takes place, then it's not going to happen. And Rupert was that person from the get-go, and we encountered a lot of times when we thought, this is just, we can't make this happen. There's just too many obstacles coming up. So I have to say that it was his commitment and his support through the whole thing to make sure we did this for John. That's actually why we're all here. So I just want to say thank you, Rupert. And now, in a true segue, I would like to introduce my former boss and current supporter, Mr. Rupert Perry. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> um, before, I, before I say a few words, um, we are lucky enough to have, I suppose the best description is a surprise uh, and late guest to this uh, gathering. And it is uh, my privilege and my honor to uh, introduce this man to you. His name is Basker Menon. And a few, few words about Basker, if, uh, if I may. Um, for those of you who don't know Basker, he joined EMI in 1956 as a uh, I suppose, well, I have to be careful how I describe it. He joined EMI in 1956, and he went on to run uh, companies for EMI in India and other parts of the world. In the early 70s, he found himself sent here to run capital, capital industries, as it was in those days. And he became the chairman and the chief executive of capital industries, and ran capital very, very su successfully for many, many years. In the early 80s, he then was given the whole of EMI's recorded business and its music publishing business to run worldwide. And he ran that and brought all of that together very successfully uh, until he left the organization in about the late 80s, 1987. So that is who you're going to hear from next. He is a big hero to all of us who worked uh, in capital and in the world of EMI. So, Basker, the stage is yours. There's one superstar he did not sign. I know. He was too modest. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I feel really, truly, greatly privileged to be able to pay my tribute and to express my deep personal sorrow at the loss of our friend and colleague of many years, John Palladino. And I particularly am delighted to be able to welcome here this morning, I presume they are all here, John's family, who honor us by their presence, and to share with them the inconsolable grief at his loss that each of us who knew this great human being continues still to feel. I first met John Palladino in 1966, many years before I came to work here for Capital. I was involved with EMI at the time, amongst many other things, on producing recordings of the Indian classical artist Pandit Ravi Shankar in our Abbey Road studios in London and in our recording facilities in India and elsewhere in the world. In the summer of that year, of 1966, we recorded at Abbey Road a unique musical recital by a prominent Western classical violinist, Yehudi Menuhin. Are you playing the actual track or? <laughs> um, and so this was a recording of um, um, Yehudi Menuhin playing a duet performance together with Ravi Shankar on the sitar of three Indian classical ragas, as they are called, which had been specifically written and arranged by Shankar for the June 1966 Bath musical festival in England, which is a very prominent part of the musical scene in that country, and where their live performance of this iconic work, which was entitled West Meets East, enjoyed an outstanding and almost mesmeric audience response. Very soon thereafter, I arrived at Capitol Tower with Ravi Shankar, and the final mixed tapes of the West Meets East recording. To see my friend Alan Livingston, who as Capital's chairman at that time, was leading a world-renowned team of in-house A&R producers to revitalize the label's global stature in US pop repertoire. Alan, after some discussion, recognized that West Meets East was a seriously classical work musically and was never intended by its distinguished creators to be a natural fusion album of a genre that was occasionally crossing over to pop in that area at that time. He agreed that we should discuss all aspects of the musical content of the album with an exceptionally talented creative and able member of Capital's mainstream a &R team. Together with the Angel Records specialists, whom of course we knew extremely well. And thus he nominated John Palladino, along with Brown Meggs and Patty Larson from Angel, to spend the day with Shankar and me, hoping that we would, in these very premises, and hoping that we would reach some clear guidance by the end of the day as to where and how Angel would take this strange and unusual album to the marketplace and to the media. Thus it was that I first met John Palladino, who was instantly charming and seemed interested, if a little intrigued initially, at the sonic contents of the West Meets East recording. And Shankar and I spent an entire working day together with him and an Angel's marketing force, Brown and Patty, in these various capital st studios, observing with growing admiration and amazement during the course of the day as Palladino continued his regular mainstream capital pop work in addition to also devoting at that time, at the same time, keenest attention and interest to our comparatively musically obscure tapes from London. Neither Pandit Ravi Shankar nor I 
ever forgot or really ever fully really recovered from the incredible experience of that long day. When we had met and observed at work a genius who was not only gifted with the proverbial golden years to record over so many, many of Capital's own outstanding superstars, but this was a man who was also blessed with a golden mind and golden musical judgment and with golden hands and golden fingers which could at the same time as he was listening carefully and making comments softly about Menuhin and Shankar to us and our West meets East recording. He seemed able com competently to electronically recreate with utmost facility and retaining authenticity and even qualitative enhancement the works of some of the world's most brilliant pop performers, artists and writers of that time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, as indeed all of you know, is what John Paladino did as he showered stars from the heavens upon Capitol Records. During the brilliant years that he worked at the label, he brought immensely enhanced enjoyment to millions of listeners of the recordings of most of our